vertical metal hydride batteries. So these things are actually quite sophisticated. You know, we've been talking about these rather clunky looking voltaic cells, you know, things that look like this, where I've got like a beaker of liquid on one side and another beaker, right? Like how the heck are you going to cram that thing into your remote control? You're not. So there's been a lot of engineering to, you know, to create these things. Okay. And so in these nickel metal hydrides, so this is our metal hydride and, um, you know, and here is our metal. Notice that it's given as M and that's because most battery companies, that's proprietary. They don't want you to know what metal they've put in there because they're making money off of this stuff. Yay, capitalism. In any event, the way that this works, okay, we have this nickel hydroxide at the cathode, which you can see right here. Um, and then you have the metal hydride at the anode. Um, and so now what's really cool, there's this plastic membrane um, that's soaked in potassium hydroxide. And so you can see it then alternates. It makes this alternating sandwich with anode, cathode, anode, cathode. And because you have this KOH solution, it allows electrons, or as you can even see hydroxide, to flow from anode, or rather the hydroxide flows from cathode to anode. And the electrons will go either way, depending on if you're charging it or if you're using it. Okay, which is pretty cool. So let's do a sample calculation, okay? So if a battery charger for a AA, and so this notation, right, that's nickel metal hydride, I want you to recognize that, supplies a charging current of 1.00 amps, how many minutes does it take to recharge the battery? You may assume a typical metal hydride battery has approximately 8.6 grams of nickel hydroxide when it's completely dead. So in other words, the reaction starts like this with the metal hydride and this rather weird nickel oxide um, complex, okay? I'm not gonna get into the name of this thing, but what we basically have is once the battery is dead, all of the mass has been pushed over to this side and we'll have 8.6 grams of this nickel hydroxide. And so, um, right, just to give you an idea, you know, it's something like one of these little things. So even though this is heavier than 8.6 grams, um, it's the, the material, right? The electrode material is what's giving us the capacity of that battery, okay? So the first thing we have to do is separate this into its two half reactions. And we've got those written over here. So we can see the anode half reaction goes like this. Metal hydride solid plus hydroxide makes metal solid plus H2O liquid and one electron. So let's write that down. And I'll try to save some room for my calculations. So the metal hydroxide plus OH makes my solid metal plus H2O plus an electron. So that's my anode half. We'll write that down. Anode, okay? Um, and so now you can see my cathode half. Here's that balanced reaction for the cathode, which is this nickel oxide hydroxide plus water plus one electron makes the nickel hydroxide plus hydroxide, okay? And so I don't expect you to get those reactions. These reactions um, are a little tricky. And so that's why I'm giving them to you. They're also proprietary, right? Some really smart engineers had to figure out how to get these things all crammed into that tiny little battery. Um, and then now that makes the nickel hydroxide plus OH minus, and we know that's the cathode, okay? So the reason why I went through to write these out is for one, we can see that it's a one electron process, right? One electron and one electron. The other reason um, why I wanted you to see what was going on here is we could see how hydroxide is exchanged between the anode and cathode, which is what is shown right here, right? Um, and then all we really need from here, you might be thinking, well, where's the cell potential? Where's all that stuff? We don't need it because if we know the mass 
of the cathode or the mass of material that's supposed to get deposited onto the cathode, that's all we need to know in addition to our charging current. Okay, So we're just going to do some good old stoichiometry like the Chem 109 days. We're going to start with this 8.6 grams of this cathode material. So 8.6 grams of nickel hydroxide. Okay, um, And we want to convert that into moles. So I did that for you already. So that's 92.7 grams for the molar mass. Confirm that you're able to get that number. Pause the video if you have to. Um, and so that gives me one mole of this compound. And I'm just going to say one mole of nickel just to make this a little bit um, straightforward. And the important thing to note here, right, is it's a one electron process. So when one mole of nickel hydroxide is formed, it had to consume one mole of electrons. Okay, so then all we have to do is use that stoichiometry and say one mole of nickel required one mole of electrons. And that's going to give me my total mole of electrons that I have to transfer. So let's just do that calculation. Okay, we can say eight, oops, uh, we can say 8.6 times, uh, I guess one all the way around, so I'll just say one equals, and then divided by 92.7. And so from there, uh, with two significant digits, I get 0 0.093 moles of electrons. So in fact, that's an even more useful number than the 8.6 grams, because really what's happening in this battery um, we need to transfer 0.093 mole electron either from cathode to anode or the other way around depending on when we're um, charging it or when we're using it. That's the magic number, just the number of moles of electrons that get just transferred. Okay? And so from there, if I want to figure out how long will it take to charge the battery if it's completely dead, so we need 0.093 mole of electron. So I'll start with that number. And you might have guessed we're going to use Faraday's constant because Faraday's constant says in one mole of electrons, there's 96,485 Coulomb. And then now what do we do from here? Well, I'll remind you an amp. So that's why I went over those units. One amp is one Coulomb per second. So if we have 1.00 amps, that is the same thing as 1.00 coulombs per second. And so now in my stoichiometry, I've got to flip that number because I want to convert seconds into minutes because the question asked me how many minutes does it take to charge the battery. Um, so now that's going to go 1.00 coulombs in one second and in one second, um, Let's see, oops, uh, other way around. 60 seconds in one minute. Um, and then now that will give me how long it'll take to charge my battery. So I can say times 96485 equals and then divided by 60. And so um, I get with two significant digits, 150 minutes. Okay. Now some reality check. Okay. One amp is humongous. And if we tried to charge one of these tiny little batteries with one amp, we would damage it. Okay. And so this is less clear how this works um, with the chemistry that we've discussed. But the idea here is when you look at these tiny little structures, if we were bombarding it with such a humongous charging rate, one amp, we would fry this battery. Okay, um, And so that's why things like your cell phone, your laptop, uh, Tesla, they all have recommended charging amperage so that you don't damage the battery. So what I have here um, is my little battery pack. I like using this. Um, EBL thing. I got this on Amazon for like 20 bucks and I always have batteries on the ready for remote controls and toys and whatnot. 
And so um, it's really hard print here, but if I look at the back of this thing, um, it tells me that it actually uses, um, oh man, that's hard to read, 100 milliamp. So on the back of that thing, it actually says 100 milliamp, which is the same as 0 0.100 amp. So in fact, that's 10 times slower than this one amp. That's the connection to how long things take to charge and the amount of juice you're gonna put in it, okay? So what that means is because in reality, this thing uses 0.1 amps instead of one amps, that means this 150 minutes is gonna be 1500 minutes, right? Times 10. So let's say in reality, times 10, so that means 1500 minutes, okay? And if I say times 10 here, 1500 minutes is kind of difficult to think in. I don't think in that kind of scale. So I'm gonna divide this by 60 to put it in hours. And if I say divided by 60 equals 25 hours, um, and that's about right. I know that seems slow, but like typically if I put a battery in here, like the night before, it'll take about a day to finish charging it up, okay? The other thing we have to consider as well is this says when it is completely dead. Very rarely will these batteries be allowed to operate under such a condition. In reality, they might have only discharged by like 25% or so. Okay, so we're actually not getting 0.093 mole of electron in reality. It's really a fraction of that, okay? And so if, let's say if it was like, I'm only really getting 25% out of this, um, so then I could multiply that number by, you know, 25%, um, and so that's like six hours, okay? And we should also recognize you might charge your battery before it's, completely dead, and that's recommended, right? You really shouldn't be charging um, your batteries, letting them go all the way to zero. I know some people talk about that, that that's you know, okay to do. Maybe it's okay to let it go to five or 10%, but you don't wanna completely deplete anode or cathode material. You want there to be some material on either side so you can allow these equilibrium reactions to proceed, okay? All the same, you now have the ability to start looking at all of your consumer electronics, the voltage, the amperage, how much power they require, how long you can get it to work, how long it takes to charge. And I find this to be really useful, practical stuff. Good reasons to go to college, learn how to charge or learn how to calculate how long it takes to charge your batteries. Uh, okay, folks, um, I will record um, one last mini video, mini lecture for our section on electrochemistry.